So welcome everyone to another session of Asia Farm Animal Day, coordinated by Farm Animal Coalitions and other organizations across Asia. As some of us already know, the majority of farm animal and fish on the planet are raised in Asia. Every single one of these billions of animals is a living, sentient individuals with needs, but the vast majority of them don't have any of those needs met and suffer because of it. That's why every 10th of October, we unite all people and our NGOs of Asia and other um, continents to make visible importance and the urgency of this issue. Hi, I'm Kate, project manager from Every Social Ventures based in Da Nang, Vietnam, and it's my pleasure to be your event moderator today. So I have some questions for your, your all audience today. Do you think you want to learn more about how the cage-free movements around the globe are conducted? What are the secrets behind their successes? Are there any takeaways to avoid common mistakes? And how does this movement benefit farm animals? If you're curious about all this or any of this, then you are in the right place at the right time. Welcome everyone to the public presentation section, Cage-Free Movement in Asia in relation with movements around the globe, projects and success. We are very happy today to welcome the presence of three experts from three different continents, Asia, Europe, and Africa. This 17-minute presentation will be very informative, especially for those who are currently advocating for cage-free laying hands and broilers. Personally, for me, who also managing a project promoting cage-free laying hands in Vietnam. This could be definitely a section that I've been looking forward to. So after my introduction, I want to guide you through the format for our sharing section today. Uh, we will have the first presentation from Dr. Dennis Buhati from African Network for Animal Welfare. So please welcome him to join our stage. Uh, hi. Dr. Dennis Bihati. Hey. Hi. Kate, thank you very much. Yeah. I think I'll share my slides and then I can. Oh, yeah. Uh, just uh, can you share oh, about your, yourself first? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. So, my name is Dr. Dennis Bihati uh, from Kenya. Uh, I work for an organization called Africa Network for Animal Welfare. Mm -hmm. uh, and our focus is uh, promoting humane treatment of all animal species. We've been doing quite uh, a bit of work on issues of cage free, not only in the country, but also in East Africa and the, across uh, the continent. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dennis Bahati. And after the presentation from Dr. Dennis Bahati, we want to enjoy the presentation from Mr. Radim Toyan from OPRAS. So please welcome to the stage, uh, Mr. Toyan. Hello. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, well, my name is Radim, Radim Trojan. I'm from Obraz, Obranci Zvířat. Uh, we are probably still the largest uh, organization in Czech Republic to advocate for animal rights. And we've been founded in 2015. And since then, we managed to ban fur farms in Czech Republic and cages and egg industry in Czech Republic. So this will be the topic I'll be talking to. And I'm very grateful for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, we have another presentation from Ms. Richa Apap Bromson from Southeast Asia, South Asia for Synergy Animals. Please welcome to the stage. Thank you, Kate, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Wisha Yapat, but you can also call me Wish for short. And I feel very honored to have an opportunity to be presenting about our work here. I am currently the public engagement directors for Southeast Asia from Synergy Animal. And when I get to present, I will also talk a little bit about our organization and our work, both in Thailand and Indonesia. So nice, nice to see everyone here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. So I will not let anyone wait any further. Uh, let's start with the first presentation from Mr. Uh, Dennis Bahati. Uh, so Dr. Bahati, can you share your screen and also start your first presentation? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Katie. Mm. It, I, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, uh, I see you already starting. Yes, I can see the slides now. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. 
Uh, so I'll introduce myself again. I said I'm Dr. Dennis Bahati, and uh, I work for a non-governmental organization called Africa Network for Animal Warfare. We are based in Kenya, and our focus is promotion of humane treatment of all animals, uh, including marine, uh, farm animals, wildlife. Um, so our focus is uh, partnering and working with stakeholders uh, just to push for the ideology of animal welfare, why it's important to do that. The focus of my presentation today is going to be on um, um, caged chicken farming uh, and the work that we've been doing as an organization uh, in my country uh, and also in Africa and uh, across the continent and trying to advocate against the practice. Um, so like I said, uh, our vision um, for the organization is that uh, we envision a world where people show compassion, protect and care of all animal species. Uh, and our mission is partnering with different stakeholders from government to policymakers to communities, um, just to ensure that uh, they see the importance of animal welfare and why it's important also uh, bringing in the aspect of um, environmental and human health and how they're all connected. So uh, I think uh, before I even share what we do, um, and, and, and just to give you an idea of how uh, the context is in, in, in not only my country, but also in Africa. Uh, something interesting that uh, for you guys who know Jen is a famous um, primatologist, he said, once that uh, a great deal of the behavior that we deem cruel is not delivered, but due to a lack of understanding. And this is one thing that we've seen is, is quite embedded, not only in my country, but also across Africa. Um, people lack knowledge and the understanding of what animal welfare is uh, and why. And uh, so that's the barrier that we're facing uh, in addressing not only animal welfare, but also chicken welfare across uh, the continent. So, like I said, um, in terms of the work that we've been doing, uh, we do quite a lot of work. But for this, uh, uh, my presentation will focus more on the work that we've been doing on K3 and the strides that we've made. And the reason why we decided to um, venture and focus on this area uh, is because we realized there's quite a big gap uh, uh, in terms of data uh, on issues of treatment across the continent, not only in my country, but we saw that. Uh, we have no data whatsoever uh, uh, when it comes to issues of what the update of use of bait cages, uh, why do farmers uh, prefer this system, how many farmers are using it, um, are there any laws or policies that guide uh, the use and adoption of this system, what are consumers saying uh, concerning these systems, are they aware or interested in issues of welfare and how they're raised. So we realized not only in my country, but in East Africa and also across the continent, there's very little data, very little data. So we think it's good to start from a point of uh, gathering baseline data, um, very, very important. Uh, and, and that will now, uh, is what has in, informed strategy uh, in an effort to address this issue. So the focus of our purpose is uh, of, of, of the work that we're doing, the research that we're doing uh, is more of uh, uh, is driven by a philosophy, not just doing research for the sake of it, but um, having an, an advocacy and an informative uh, approach, uh, ensuring that the data that we gather ensure that um, the, the specific laws are protected and, and their welfare. So we all know about the negative impacts about caged farming um, and, and why has been banned in quite a number of countries, um, in Europe and in the US. Um, it, it, it's, it has so many uh, issues. And we've seen that in Africa, it's slowly gaining momentum. Uh, and quite a lot of small scale, uh, very urban farmers are picking up the system uh, because of the, um, the benefits uh, associated with it. So we say it's good to actually get to understand know what the farmers are thinking and why they're preferring this system as compared to the other systems because without that information it would be quite hard for us to know what to do. So these are just a few pictures of, of 
few of the farm visits that we did uh, in my country, and you can see uh, the issues that are associated uh, with these cages and, and how uh, they cause quite a lot of issues. Um, so, like I said, we started off this work uh, in uh, 2019, and we started off in Kenya, uh, and uh, we later expanded uh, our scope, and uh, we targeted three other East African countries. We went to Uganda, Tanzania, and also Rwanda. Uh, at the moment, we are um, doing the study in uh, Nigeria, Ghana, and also Sierra Leone. And the focus of our study is to gain critical data, and I'll, I'll highlight on the uh, objectives of the work that we and the study that we are doing. Uh, number one, we want to understand when it comes to um, the prevalence and status of battery cage uh, use as a management system uh, in countries where we went in the work. We also want to understand in terms of graphical zones, which areas are battery cages being adopted more. We also want to understand in terms of the stakeholders' knowledge uh, from the farmers to the business people who are supplying these cages, what is Uh, also, get a. Uh, yeah, oh, I think it's just my internet connection. Sorry? Maybe my yeah internet connection is a little bit frozen, oh. but maybe it's my side that you're oh. on your oh. end. Yeah, okay. 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 Can you hear me now? Yeah, I, we can hear you now much better. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Mm -hmm. I was just highlighting on the objectives and and the reasons why we uh we went out and uh, did this research. Uh, so I had highlighted a few of them. Uh, I think I was point of where we want to also establish a baseline for future assessment. People who also come and do a similar assessment uh, on issues of battery cages. We also wanted to understand what are the policies and, and legal frameworks um, and what they say specifically on issues of uh, battery cages, uh, are the laws supporting it or not. Then finally, we also wanted to understand in terms of consumer and public views on, on poultry farming in our country. And, and whether consumers are keen on, on issues of cages and whether it affects their purchasing ability at the end. So the approach that we used, we did uh, personalized interviews with uh, government uh, veterinary officials uh, within uh, administrative units uh, in the different countries where we're doing this work. We also uh, had quite a lot of uh, focus group discussions with farmers and other key stakeholders just to gather primary data on big issues. So this basically highlights uh, the people that we targeted and, and we wanted to gain a countrywide um, view uh, and assessment of happening and not just doing uh, random something, getting a whole idea of what's happening in these specific countries. Uh, now, in terms of the findings that we got, um, and, and I've just summarized, uh, because what we realized is, is the situation is kind of like similar in the, um, the African countries where we did this work, from Kenya to Tanzania to Uganda to Rwanda, and even the current work that we're doing in West Africa, the, the findings that we're getting are almost similar in terms of uh, the use and adoption of this system. So we realized, number one, that it's not the highly uh, adopted system. Uh, so basic cages is not that prevalent, even though it's gaining momentum slowly. Uh, and more cause of the high initial capital that's required to start this system. Um, so you will find mostly elite farmers are the ones who are uh, using it. So the main system that's being adopted is battery cage. Uh, the other thing that we also realized is that quite a number of governments uh, are in support of this specific system. Uh, and the reason is uh, it is actually seen as a, as, as a way of alleviating poverty. Uh, it's creating employment for the youth. So quite a lot of governments are prioritizing it and they're encouraging the youth, the women who adopt these systems because it solves quite a number of issues uh, in society. So welfare considerations are not uh, at the top of okay. um, issues that... Now, the other thing that we also realized is in terms of consumer views and perceptions, consumers are more keen on 
spices, for example, uh, of egg products. They're not keen on how these animals are raised. They are not keen on um, the management system, uh, all the welfare needs of the birds. They're more interested in how much the end product is. So we also saw that there's quite a big and quite a lot also done in terms of consumer awareness uh, sensitization. So the other thing that we also found that was quite interesting uh, is uh, the veterinary profession uh, and, and the people who are mandated to actually ensure that the welfare and health of animals. And we saw that uh, it, it, it's quite unfortunate because most of the high level institutions that are taking these courses on veterinary medicine do not lean more on the welfare aspect. So they just on the benefits, the Bitricate system, but they don't highlight on the welfare needs of these birds. So you find most professions within the animal health sector are pro Bitricate, uh, which is quite, quite unfortunate. Um, so the findings, like I said, uh, are kind of similar. Uh, what we, we, we got in the different countries are, are one more, more of the same thing. Um, the other thing that I also wanted to highlight is in terms of the policy and legal framework um, and, and what we got when we did this analysis, we found that uh, quite a lot, most of the laws within these countries are on, on, on it. System and whether it's legal or illegal. So the law is very, very silent. So you find that uh, quite a number of uh, farmers are are at liberty to be adopt and use this, which is quite unfortunate uh, because you can't uh, go to a farmer and tell them that what you do. Uh, to them, the law is, is, is so they are able to, to, uh, to adopt the system uh, whether they want or not. So there's quite a lot of reforms that are required in our policy and frameworks, uh, and not only in my country, but across the whole continent. Uh, we need stronger laws that ensure that um, animal welfare, and not only just chicken welfare, but animal welfare is entrenched, and also enforcement is. Um... So in terms of the recommendations that came out, um, I think the two strong ones uh, that we saw is uh, we need uh, one, an Afrocentric and holistic approach that addresses uh, the welfare of the chickens, but also ensures that issues like food security and safety guarded as well as the livelihoods of this specific community. So uh, we've realized that the situation in Africa is kind of different uh, from uh, other continents. Uh, and we, we, we need to come up with a very, very unique and specific way on how we will address this issue. Uh, like I initially said in my presentation, there's a big knowledge gap on issues of animal welfare in the continent. So one of the things that we need to actually focus on is we need to actually have a very, very strong and robust awareness and sensitization campaign so that people, number one, uh, are able to understand what animal welfare is and why it's important. Uh, because if, if you don't do that, then people will, really, will not actually see the benefit. Uh, one of the interesting things that we've come across is that people who ask us very, very hard questions and they, they would ask, of, of the two, human welfare and animal welfare, which one should be? And, and sometimes it's, it's a very, very hard question to, to answer. Uh, but basically, we've realized that that's one area that we need to concentrate and ensure that we sensitize quite a number of stakeholders from farmers, uh, um, higher learning institutions to government officials, uh, even the media. Uh, and I think as, as I close on my presentation, one of the things I also wanted to highlight is how we've leveraged and, and used uh, the, um, the local media. And not only the local media, but also the international uh, media platform to the um, the agenda of page food. So we've partnered with quite a number of journalists. Uh, we've done feature stories. We've done uh, media talk shows just to bring out the, the, the whole aspect Pages and uh, why it's not a sustainable system and why it's infringing on the welfare. So that's one area where we've actually capitalized a lot and we have seen quite a big success. 
uh, on that end. So I think I have come to the end of my presentation. So I think I will give it back to you, Kate. Thank you very much. Uh, I've put uh, my email address and also the website of our organization in case you need to talk more about the work that we do um, and how we can partner with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm really impressed with the resource scope and how you you address each of the concern from the farmers. You, you do the research with the farmers and to, with the consumers. So I think really, that's really comprehensive and that's definitely gonna give people like someone who, who doesn't know about how the cage free or how about the cage production status in East Africa. I have an overview of what is happening. And I I I, I know like it's also kind of the same thing in Vietnam when you also like cage production is still gaining popularity. It's still like some kind of like means of like to, to earn more money for farmers. So I understand from that perspective. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna move move on to the next uh, presentation uh, from Mr. Radim Toyan. So please, uh, can you share this, uh, the slides and um, start your presentation, yes. please? Yeah. Yes, thank you. All right, I hope you can see my screen right now. Can you? Yeah, perfect. Just so let me start a presentation. All right, C can you see the presentation, right? Yes, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much again for the, uh, for me to be able to speak here on behalf of Obras Obranci Zvířat, uh, Czech organization to advocate for animal rights. We've been founded in 2015. Our biggest successes so far were to ban fur, fur farms in Czech Republic and to ban cages or so-called enriched cages in egg industry for egg lying hands. So I'll be talking about the second one. And currently, if you'd be interested, you can reach out to me. Uh, we are working on the broil welfare campaign, which I am leading as well. So uh, you can reach out to me uh, later about that as well, if you'd be interested. But let's get to the cage-free cage, uh, cage -free campaign. Uh, first thing first, I would like you to um, I would like to put it as some kind of a story, you know. And first, before we started the actual like legal campaign for the legal ban uh, of cages in Czech Republic, we need to, needed to do the corporate campaign. The corporate campaign was uh, started in June 2018, and uh, it started by publishing of the footage of caged hands, and it got just huge media coverage. Uh, basically, the issue uh, with caged hands in the egg industry immediately became a huge public issue. Everybody was talking about it for like a month or two. It was all over the media. Everyone was discussed uh, this just the, the public was horrified by the conditions that uh, the hands in the egg industry have to face. And all big retailers made a commitment to stop selling eggs from caged hands by 2025. Some did even faster because uh, later in like 2019, 2020, uh, some retailers committed or even stopped selling uh, eggs from air caged hands. So the corporate campaign was very successful and a little pressure was needed to push all the retailers and all the, uh, almost all the food producers to stop uh, buying eggs from the caged hands for from cage uh, cage systems, uh, there is a like photo from uh, Coop campaign. It was just the only uh, only campaign that was needed to push the final uh, retailer to commit as well. So that was the corporate part of the campaign, and then came the legislative campaign for the legislative uh, ban which is the main story I will, I will be telling you about. And I really uh, like to like put this as a story so you would see like how everything evolved this uh, campaign happened from february 2019 to november 2020 and it all started with this particular video i cannot share you uh, share it with you but uh, i will share with you the link because the video is our most successful video so far and the reason why i'm telling you because this video sort of like puts the narrative in which obras is always talking to its uh, to its audience in february 2019 we launched the launch of the campaign cage free campaign was supported by this video which was featuring our chairman marek walking through empty fur farms, which were ban banned in the previous campaign and were empty from 2019. 
and he was reminding people that it was them who achieved this and motivating them that they can do the same thing with cages in the ang industry. This is like the framework that we've been always talking to the public that it is them who are doing this, you know, motivating them that here you have 20,000 animals raised just for fur every year. And here you can do the same thing for 5 million hens kept in cages. So it is you who can do this. And the video all, all over, it has such a like positive vibe, even though it shows in some uh, one point the, the actual footage of the of the caged hands, it still has like this positive vibe that you can change this. You can stop this thing in Czech Republic as you did with the fur farms because you signed the petition, because you participated in ca campaign actions, etc. So it's our most successful campaigning video so far till this day, I think as well. So. There was a launch that really helped. And then there came like this, uh, you would say like there is this like boring slide of lobbying preparations because uh, we needed a lot of research to support our claim. Uh, we started to meet politicians from different party, uh, parties, from House of Representatives first, and we were working on analysis to support successful lobbying. So the first thing we needed was definitely economic analysis. Like how much, uh, how much it will cost the transition for farmers and uh, consumers on the uh, on the consumer price? How much the price of each egg will rise by this this transition? Then we needed the welfare analysis actually to show that caged hens suffer much more than in the cage-free systems. Then we needed legal analysis to support that uh, this ban is something compatible. Uh, with uh, the Czech law system and also time and space requirements analysis, which showed uh, whether what kind of deadline is possible, you know, how, uh, what time farmers need to do to fully transit to cage free systems in Czech Republic. So Obras was waiting for the uh, pro animal protection bill to be uh, submitted and re uh, read in the Czech parliament. Uh, in that time, we already successfully lobbied and got a, a group of politicians, mainly from the Liberal Pirate Party in the Czech Pirate Parliament, who were submitting the bill, who were sub submitting the change, the ban of cages. And during this time, a lot of meetings, as I said, from different par uh, with politicians, different parties took place as well. And in December 2019, the first reading of the bill and cross-party press conference with members of the different parties supporting the bill, uh, the ban uh, was held in the parliament. So, but also during summer 2019, uh, we not only uh, like uh, did this, like what you would call background work, this behind the curtain work, this lobbying meeting with the politicians, we also wanted to spread more awareness about the issue. So we did this hand tour they, that um, involved seven plush hands touring across the regions of Czech Republic. And it's really simple action, like uh, plush hands uh, traveling across the regions of Czech Republic. And uh, these hands have their own Instagram accounts, et cetera. And the reason why I'm telling this, it's really like positive action. It's not something that would uh, be working with the footages of the cage hands and the horrors they are facing in the farm, factory farming. But uh, it's really helped raising awareness about the issue in the region and sort of proving to politicians that this is not an issue that only people in Prague in our capital care about. Because there is this stereotype in Czech Republic that people in big cities and in Prague our capital care about these issues of animal welfare and about this like more progressive things more than the people in the countryside and in the region so uh, it was really effective because it got a lot of media outputs over 250 media outputs in the local news so that uh, the issue of caged hands got spread even to to regions of czech republic but then uh, the first problem arrived uh, during the first uh, first vote in the in the parliament. The bill the bill was rejected, and we kind of expected it would be rejected because um, we knew that the strongest party in the House of Representatives in Czech Republic, Ano Party, uh, whose logo you can see here. This is the graphic we made afterwards. 
uh, was full of uh, businessmen who were somehow tied to the agro-business, agro-businesses. So even the leader of the party, then Prime Minister Andrei Babish, the guy you can see on the photo right here, was the guy, he, this guy actually ran uh, the biggest uh, agricultural business in Czech Republic. He was the second wealthiest man in the Czech Republic in that time. So uh, he himself actually ran some farms with caged hands. So it was obvious that this is something uh, that would be a problem that when our prime minister was, was a businessman and had his own money in this, uh, in this kind of business. However, uh, lucky enough, this um, this person is also very sensitive about his pub public image. So you can see this on this photo, like him picturing himself with hands. And so we started immediately campaign against him, targeting directly him, party leader Andrei Babish, our prime minister, because we knew that he is sensitive about his image and he doesn't want to be displayed as a person who you know, who's tied to the animal abuse. This is something that he doesn't want to be seen in the eye of the public like. Uh, like. So uh, this, this really worked. And uh, he agreed eventually that uh, the Anno party, his party will uh, vote for the ban. But then in February, 2020, COVID-19 pandemic started in Czechia and everything got frozen. And uh, we needed to come back before the second, second vote happened in the House of Representatives, which happened in September. And right before that, we decided to do more campaign actions, which I will work, uh, talk more about right now. Uh, the first one and one of the most that got a lot of media coverage was one month in a cage. It was a happening before the planet vote and our activists were taking 12 hour shifts in an enlarged cage with 19 sculptures of hands. And it, it happened right in the, uh, front of the Czech parliament. It was an action that uh, we needed to more like spread awareness amongst the politicians. This is still active issue because like the, the vote happened in, uh, I think, January 2020. And now it was September 2020 after the COVID-19 pandemic, the first wave of it. And we were afraid that uh, the public will just forget, forget about this issue. So we needed a lot of campaign actions, a lot of actions more pressure on politicians so that they will know that this is still an active issue. This is still something they need to care about. Also, one thing that was the fact that we found out that these eggs in the cage-free systems are mixed with the uh, systems from caged hands. Uh, so we uh, gathered materials that we then hand out to the um, uh, journalist and the TV report uh, was, um, was released that included hidden camera footages from egg farms showing that eggs are uh, from caged hands are mixed with eggs from other systems. So basically there was this farm where there were like, I think, three uh, holes with caged hands and one hole, uh, one cage free uh, hole. And we found out that these eggs are mixed and all like uh, are put into the uh, to the boxes that are uh, that are um, signed as being cage free. So uh, this was something like um, this is something that check check uh, you know public is very sensitive about being deceived in this way. So it worked a lot. So the call to action on this video that you can see our chairman is this was a video uh, we released and our chairman was really calling. Uh, people to action just this is the only way to end this is to ban cages because the public is being deceived whether you think that you are not supporting cages when you're buying cage-free eggs uh, you can be deceived because uh, the egg producers are mixing mixing these eggs and uh, none of us have really can be sure about whether we are or we are not uh, supporting with our money this type of animal abuse so uh, this is something that really supported our claim that helped as well. And uh, during the campaign finish, we had three uh, another videos, three another like events. 
Uh, first of them were influencers filmed in cage. Uh, they were like VIP uh, personalities, influencers doing their thing, but they were like stuck in the cages. Like there was a dancer, uh, she tried to dance, but uh, she were in the cage, so she could not. Then there was a drummer influencer who was trying to drum, but he could not because he was locked in a cage, etc. So we got a lot of media attention in uh, in the news that were focusing on celebrities with that. Also, then we got the, the football team for hands. There was a video of a very, um, <clears throat> very famous Czech football team uh members like uh, supporting this uh, this cage uh, cage free uh, cage free movement you can see their uh, picture with uh, with uh, one of the football players uh, holding uh, hand and uh, it got us a lot of media attention in uh, sports news as well so we kind of like covered all different types of media with that and also we had a, a appeal or a cage a video of cage free ta farmer talking about the lies of the agricultural sector because agricultural sector was lobbying heavily to stop this ban. They were lobbying uh, against us all the time. Uh, they even hired some PR agent, uh, uh, PR agency, etc. So it was very very harsh. Uh, but it was good that there are also like farmers who are willing to speak for the ban mostly because they were profiting out of it, uh, to be frank, I think so. So, but uh, uh, there was a cage free farmer who told uh, like sense to the public and told, uh, told about the lies of agricultural sectors and also said that there are other countries who did that and it worked. So in September 2020, the bill was passed. It will pass through the House of Representatives. There is our chairman who led the campaign. He's uh, having this sign, thank you, because as I said, this was all the time the narrative that people are doing this because it was always like raising our engagement when we were telling that people are doing this. It's not us, we are only like uh, coordinating everything. So 2020, the bill was passed uh, and uh, by 2027, it will be illegal to raise hands in cages in Czech Republic. First, it was passed through the House of Representatives, and in October, it was passed uh, through Senate, and then it was signed by the president. But I'm mentioning mostly the House of Representatives because that's where the biggest fight, biggest clash was happening. So thank you very much for uh, being here, and you can reach out to me for another question uh, to this email address. Thank you. Congratulations. You have to achieve a lot of, like, important milestone in such late in two years, I guess, from 2018 to 2020, yeah. yeah. And yeah, we can see a lot of like strategy here from like peer base to like motivation and then lobby and then confrontation. And I think you you move from very like different angles in within two years. I think that is amazing, yeah. And I think a lot of people are gonna contact you for, <laughs> more like, advice and <laughs> feel free to do so yeah thank you thank yeah. you <laughs> thank you and last but not least we have uh, miss witch uh can you share your slide and also uh, you can start your presentation now yeah of course thank you so much kate for the transition and i agree with you kate that that was um inspiring about like the, the successes mm -hmm in Czech, um, yeah, it, I might reach out to you soon, Rajan, to <laughs> ask about, the, uh, especially interested in the flash, flash hand action. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'd like to hear more about it. So it's really hard to follow these two presentations because both speakers are amazing. Um, so it's hard to be the last one, but I try my best. So could you please tell me if you see my slides? Yes, we do. Yes, that's great. So thank you so much. I will start now. Um, one second. Sorry, I have some technical issue. Let me try again. Um, So how about now? Can you see my slides? Yes. 
Yes, Anne. Okay, just the slides, right? Okay, sounds great. So thank you again, Kit, for the um, for the translation and for um, moderating these talks. So um, my name is Witch, as I have as Kate has introduced me earlier. And then today I will be talking about our efforts to remove cages from the egg industry in Thailand and Indonesia. So a little bit about our organization. So our organization is called Synergia Animal, and we were founded in 2017 in Latin America. First, we, we started working there, and then we expanded our work to Thailand and Indonesia in 2019. So we are Global South organizations. We were founded in the Global South, and then we focus our efforts on the Global South countries only. And so just in case if um, some of you, some people, if you have not heard of the term Global South before, um, it's a, like a term that broadly refers to nations that are relatively more disadvantaged in terms of economy and income. So it's our mission to only focus on countries that are neglected and there are not a lot of other organizations working on protect, um, protection of farmed animals. So you will not see us working in the US, for example. And on the slide here, you see um, where we are working currently. So just South Amer um, Latin America and Southeast Asia for now. So as an organization, we have a vegan value. I have been vegan and for like for many years, I lost count. And then I have been advocating for animal rights for more than five years. Everyone in our leadership position is vegan and really believe in this value. We want to see the end of factory farming, but we get to be understood a lot because we like some people think that we are encouraging people to buy cashew eggs because one of our strategies is to campaign for cam it's campaigning against major food corporations to move away from battery cages. The ones you can, um, Dr. Bahati talked about earlier, um, the system that you can see in on the slide right here. But no, we don't encourage people to buy any animal products at all, cage or cage free. If it's practical for each individual, we would like to see them to switching to a plant-based food. And, but we will ex, um, but we are we are advocating uh, I mean we are campaigning and ask for companies to remove um, to move away from cages because we see that the end of cages it's a pragmatic and urgent step to reduce animal suffering while while um, we are moving towards a more plant-based system. So products from factory farms like cage eggs are far too cheap right now it's too cheap and like the costs that are being paid right now it's paid by animal suffering and because the animal products from um, from intensive factory farming are so cheap right now plant-based food can sometimes not compete with the price so we are um, we would like to get rid of this intensive system not to only reduce animal suffering but we would like um, we would like to create a system where plant-based products can compete more in terms of cost. Also, right now we are um, we have not started our legislative work yet. We have not engaged with the government. We have not been advocate. Well, we have not started advocating for the laws that to ban cages. And here's the reason: we start with major companies first like especially the multinational ones, the ones from the US or from North America. And here's the reason. Commitments from companies like this can influence eggs producers to move away from the worst confinement of, of um, hens in the egg industry. And once many huge players in the industry move away from cages, we believe that it will be easier to work with legislations because when like when major major companies have moved away from cages they will be unlikely to be opposed to the legislation to um, to ban cage because they have already transitioned and it will be faster for animals too to start um, the uh, pressure campaigns against company first 
because legislation can take a really long time, especially in this region. So just to summarize, overall, we have a bigger goal. Um, our end goal is not to remove cages, but we would like to end factory farming and create a better conditions for a plant-based food system to be competitive and thrive. But um, we are going to focus um, this talk on our efforts to remove cages from the egg industry, right? So I would like to start by talking by like, I would like to talk about how we go about doing this in Thailand, Indonesia. So as I mentioned earlier, right now we are only focusing on pressure campaign against major food producer, um, not major food producer, I'm sorry, but major corporations, um, especially the international ones who are that are headquartered in the, uh, in the global North countries. So we use a combination of positive outreach and also consumer awareness campaigns to encourage major corporations to act faster. And then now, um, so what we ask when, when we have meetings with companies, what we usually ask is we, will, we ask them to announce the commitments to stop sourcing eggs from farms that still keep hens in cages publicly on their website as a promise to the public and also to, to the producers that they will no longer source from, um, from farms that use cages. So um, we start with, I mentioned earlier, we start with positive engagement, right? What does it mean? So we um, send a lot of emails to many companies who use eggs, who are big buyers of egg and egg products. And then we ask for a meeting, we share with them why it is an urgent issue, why it is very important for companies to announce the cash free commitment. Um, and we share science scientific knowledge and resources that we have. We tell the companies the key welfare benefits of cage-free production. And then we also tell them that consumers are being more and more aware of where the food comes from. And like, it is better for them to present themselves as a company that who are, um, who are socially conscious and care about animals. Otherwise they will falling out of trend, right? And then at the end, we share the list of cash-free egg suppliers who companies can contact to start sourcing, um, sourcing eggs from, um, from, um, from cash-free farms. So that's our engagement like stage, right? Our positive engagement stage. Um, sometimes with companies who we would like to see act faster, but um, have not act fast enough, uh, 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 like as fast as we would like to see, we, we will start consumer awareness campaigns. So what does it mean by consumer awareness campaigns? So we do everything we can to put pressure on companies. We post online petitions um, saying that many companies have announced the cash free commitments and but this one particular company have not done so. And this one particular company who are, we are campaigning against or it's, um, it's falling behind the, their competition competitors so we sometimes we use that mess, that kind of messaging to pressure companies to act faster so we launched facebook and instagram ads and online ads on other platforms as well to invite people to sign their name in the petition or also to educate people to know more about this issue as well and like after that every like record um like we usually try to send emails to um, key decision makers in the company that we are campaigning so to, to report them about the update of our campaigns. For example, this month there, there are this many people who signed the petition to ask your company to announce the cash free policy. So this month, um, 50,000 people have seen our ads on our ads on Instagram, or we have placed the ads on the train station, like, so these are the things that we keep uh, regularly inform companies so that they feel the pressure. They know that we are campaigning, uh, that they know that we are here and we will not stop until they announce the cash free commitment. So um, I would like to show you some examples of what we have done in Thailand and Indonesia. So when we say place offline ads, here's one of the example. 
um, this is from Bangkok. We place offline ads on billboards or public transportation. So this one is an ad on on express boats in Bangkok. So in Bangkok, we still use boats to um, people still use boats to commute, especially especially people who live on like on the suburb, who have to commute into the city for work. They use this um, express boats on the canal. So we place this ads on the boat. Um, this is for McDonald's, and a bonus for this one is that this. Um, this pier happens to be located very close to McDonald's head office in Thailand. So we are sure that some of the employees or even key decision makers who have to come to work in the office regularly, they will definitely see this advertisement. This one is another example of our online ads in Jakarta, Indonesia. So we place this one, it's for, it's a, it's a campaign ads for ANW. So as I mentioned earlier, we are targeting companies who are from like multinational companies first because they already have the commitment elsewhere. So our messaging, our argument is that because they have the commitment in other countries, it only makes sense for them to extend the same commitment for their operations in Asia. So this one is a train ad in Jakarta, Indonesia. We placed this ad on like the commuter train and it, it was very successful. We get a lot of people to um, scan the QR code and um, sign the petition. Even if people don't scan the QR code, they will still see this ad and know that, okay, a, like the, this campaign is ongoing and ANW still doesn't have any cash free policy for Indonesia. So we place on offline ads on public transportations like this, and we also regularly organize street actions to increase pressure to companies as well. So we sometimes stand in front of one of the stores, but if we would like to escalate it further, we will protest in front of the headquarters. So it's a peaceful, like it's very peaceful. We don't do anything that is against the law in the countries that we operate in. So we stand very peacefully in front of companies headquarters or in front of some stores of the companies um, holding banners or signs to ask consumers, um, people who walk past by to um, invite them to sign the petition. And then we will like also would like employees who work there to see and be informed that our campaign is ongoing as well. So this is in Bangkok, Thailand in front of in front of the building where McDonald's Thailand office is located. And yeah, we at the end, we delivered this banner to the um, to the manager of McDonald's store that is um, that is located in the same building. Unfortunately, they did not accept a banner. So we follow up this banner and um, deliver it at the head office later on. Um, and this is uh, street actions for McDonald's as well in Indonesia. So some, some people might ask, why are we doing this? Why are we conducting street actions and offline ads? Is it really successful? So street actions and offline ads like this serve three purposes. So first to inform people about our campaign and invite them to join the movement, invite them to sign the petition, or if they are not interested in signing the petition yet, at least they will know they will be like they will be informed that currently eggs the majority of eggs in the country are sourced from a sort from the system that is extremely cruel towards hands so second purpose is to mobilize companies and get them to talk to us so sometimes when we launch the campaign it's because um they um they did not reply to our email and they refused to speak to us we hope that um, street actions like this will um, mobilize companies to start talking to us again. And third is to get media attention so that we can pressure companies to start talking to us and responding to our campaigns. So we started our work in 2019 and we have been very successful. I mean, we have not reached the point where all cages are banned yet. We will reach there um, in the future, but here's where we start. We have been uh, we have been getting many commitments from major food companies, both at the international level and the local ones. Um, the, I, the most iconic one is the one from RBI, um, Restaurant Brand Internationals, who also own Burger King. 
So we we got um, we managed to um, negotiate with them and got the commitment that covers Thailand and Indonesia. And we are hoping to see more and more commitments from now on. So apart from corporate campaigns, we just launched um, cash free accountability report covering five countries in Asia. Um, so you can visit our website um, later on. I can send the URL on the chat later. But what what is what is the accountability report? So we have we have gotten commitments from companies, right? Now it is time to fall like to see whether these companies are actually fo following through with their promises or not. So we send uh, we send questionnaire to companies and ask them how many percentage of cash free eggs have they started sourcing. Most companies have made some progress in like the global north countries already, but they report very little progress for Asia, and that's our and that's our goal. We would like to motivate companies to transit to actually transition towards a more cash free um, supply chain in Asia, and not just make a commitment and not doing anything. So we, so we, after we get the response from company, we rank these companies in tier system according to whether they show progress in Asia or not, whether they are actually making the efforts to follow through their promise or not. And yeah, the rank will also include companies that don't have the commitment yet as well. These companies will be at the lower rank the companies who have not reported for Asia will be like slightly higher rank, but still low, because we would like to really see companies making the progress um, in, 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 in this region. So you can visit our website later on if you're interested to learn more. But yeah, that would be the end of my, of my presentation. Um, so thank you so much to everyone for your attention. And if you have any questions, you can um, you, know, you can reach out to me. I will leave my email in the chat. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I now I see how the confrontation and the pressure can work really well with the business. And I think it's a really good case that I can see that with uh, Toyan in Czech Republic, he showed uh, the consumer what they achieved, what they have they achieved through their their. The, the protests and from in Thailand you show the business that the consumer is thinking like this and they are moving like this and the business also should move towards the consumer so I think that will be really great because sometimes the connection between the consumers and the corporate they are like not really there so the consumer and the business they don't talk directly to each other and we need to be there to like to like connect two people and show that they are just like move, should move toward each other. Yeah, that's really nice. Uh, I, I see a lot of questions in the question list. So I, I think we have around 10 minutes left. So I, we're gonna pr prioritize around three to four questions. Uh, the first question that we have is uh, for uh, Rich. Um, so the question is, do you think that increasing the price of animal products would be a good way to stop people from buying them? What are the reactions of the government and farmer against your campaign, especially in producing countries of like agriculture communities, just like in Thailand and Vietnam, we produce a lot of like uh, yeah. the exports, yeah. Thank you, Kate. Um, so yeah, we think it's uh, one of the one of the ways to discourage people from um, consuming more animal products. Mm -hmm. And also, we think that it's one of the ways to discourage companies to invest more in animal products as well. We have to um, make it more make it more challenging somehow for companies to um, to to produce animal products. And actually, they uh, companies have to be the one who absorb the cost, right? Right now, mm -hmm. um, for example, eggs right now are really cheap because hens have to suffer tremendously to keep the eggs to keep the mm -hmm. eggs price low. So this is what um, this is what we are trying to tell companies. We're telling them that okay, you have to be the one who absorb the cost when you change when you transition, and you cannot just push this burden on consumers or on the animals. And uh, the other question is about the government, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, so we have not been engaging with the government directly because our strategy for now is to um, engaging with companies, right? So I can tell you about the reaction from companies. So they always, they always bring up this excuse that oh, we are going to make food more expensive for people, especially people with low income who think that eggs are like the cheapest source of protein. So the reaction, um, it's like that. They are very resistant to um, transition to the cash-free system. But we always bring up this argument that, yes, okay, um, anything that is more sustainable and more ethical is going to cost more. It's just like any other um, CSR policies, it is going to cost more. Nothing that is better will be as cheap as it is right now. Um, mm -hmm. So that's our main argument. I, I hope I answered the question. Yes, very crystal clear. And I think we should make that clear to the corporate that we cannot do the cost optimization and do sustainability at the same time. We have to choose one. Well, one of the other, yeah. Uh, so uh, another, the other question is for Toyam. Uh, so the question is, is the general population in Czech Republic ready for better welfare standards or even alternative diets? Or do you think this is just like a political move that needs to be happen at the government level first and then it's gonna have to shift people's mind? Oh, we actually, uh, the one thing I haven't mentioned, we actually carried out a public research, uh, the public opinion research, mm -hmm. and it showed that 86% of uh, Czech uh, public is for banning cages. So the politicians in Czech Republic are really uh, really sensitive about the public image, as I said, uh, as it was with the Mr. Babish, our then prime minister, or other politicians that actually were against him because uh, he he was a lot of time he was accused of running business, this really agriculture business, and that he's a, he has a conflict of interest. So the other politicians use this theme of banning cages to fight against him. So mm -hmm. uh, the public opinion was very important and it was the initial thing. I think in Czech Republic, it's uh, mostly the people were so horrified by the images, by the footages of cage hands, because a lot of people remember from, their, uh, from them being young, how like hands were living on the countryside. And mm -hmm. when they see the factory farming, they were just shocked by the conditions. So it helped a lot. And that's why 86% of the public was uh, against the uh, against uh, against cage uh, cages in the egg industry and it helped a lot to lobby this yeah afterwards. yeah thank you and i i think that's the reason why the footage is really helpful at that at that time because people like they're really like waiting for it and now they oh yeah they have to take an action yeah and i think it's also the same in vietnam like we, when i talk about cage production many people they don't know because the image from the childhood, uh, they, they only know about free range and they think all oh, the eggs in the supermarket is like that. Yeah, but um, we just also did a consumer event just like uh, last week, like 400 people come in and they see the image of the chickens in cage and they are shocked. They know, that I, they don't know things like that. And like their children, they, yeah, they first they don't know about the cage production, yeah. And uh, another question for me, uh, for doctor. Bahati. So the question is, um, in your opinion, how likely are animal welfare laws to be introduced, strengthened or enforced in the four uh, countries that you have studied? Which African country have the best legislation and enforcement? Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of uh, the, 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 the reforms that we really need, especially in our um, you no know, animal welfare laws. Uh, one thing that uh, we have a big issue, uh, especially in East Africa, you'll find part of the quite a number of the laws are quite updated. For example, in Kenya, the law that we are currently using on animal welfare, uh, it's called the Prevention of Cruelty, uh, was actually developed in the city, never been um, uh, revised. Uh, we are currently working on 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 a bill at the moment. It takes. Uh, it, it takes quite a long, long process. That's one of the biggest challenges that we've seen, uh, not only in my country, but across Africa. It takes quite a long time for, for laws to actually be developed uh, that get mm -hmm. on issue of animal welfare. 
Uh, I think the one country that might be quite ahead is South Africa. I think the laws are a bit better or and more warfare. Uh, but for the other countries, um, it, it's quite a challenge. Let me just say that. It's quite a challenge to get politicians on the table. Uh, and if it's something that they do not agree with, um, they will not actually support it. Uh, I like how Trojan was saying that uh, in his country, they're more keen on public image. In, in my country, they are not interested. Whether it yeah. depends a bad picture on them, they don't care. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that, that a lot needs to be done um, on that end. And, and, and that's why for us, I think the approach would be more sensitizing uh, the public first so that they for, for such reform. Yeah, I, I think yeah, it's, we all have like the same approach. Maybe the public need to be awakened first and then it comes to the government. So can I have a follow-up question, like what on the next step for African network of animal welfare? What would be your like next move on this? Yeah. Um, so so you are asking our next move on on issues of um... on uh, improving the the status of case production. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we are actually focusing right now, and mm -hmm. I, I had highlighted in my presentation. First, we want to gather uh, um, as much data as we can and, and get a, an, an, a continental idea of what's happening in the whole continent. Um, mm -hmm. And then that one now give us an idea in terms of which approach uh, we'll take. Uh, but based on the preliminary findings that we've received, uh, we've seen that there's need for quite a lot of sensitization um, at, at different levels uh, and different stakeholders need to be sensitized on issues. Uh, animal welfare, you know, uh, from farmers to consumers uh, to government officials, even higher learning institutions. So there's need for that robust organization, and, and that's basically what we are um, focusing on as an organization, um, as, as well as dealing that with our politicians, although that one might take years, <laughs> willing to try and see whether we achieve. Okay, yeah. Um, so another, uh, and we still have some time. So we, I think we can have another last question uh, for Ms. Rich. Uh, it's also the closing question for today. Um, so how do you feel about fast food companies like Burger King offering plant-based options? Do you think it's good for consumers to have plant-based choices or that it's frustrating that this company keep earning more and continue using meat animal products by offering this plant-based option. Yeah. I think it's good that they mm. recognize that they have to start offering plant-based plant-based option to consumers. Mm. I also think we have to recognize that they have to reduce the like they have to make progress. Um, they mm. I mean these companies have already made the commitment to all these all cash VAs, right? Um, it's good that they have offered, have started offered plant-based options. We also have to see what, like, if they are actually making efforts in transitioning, like, their supply chain to uh, more cash-free ones as well or not. So, so um, to answer the question, I, I don't think it's, I mean, I, I don't think it's bad that they start offering plant plant-based food. Companies will make profits. I mean, they will look for ways to make profits anyway. Um, so uh, that's not surprising. I'm, I don't think I'm frustrated by that. Mm -hmm. But what we have to focus on, also, like apart from whether they, whether they start offering plant-based plant -based options or not, is to see whether they actually make the progress according to what they have made the commitments or not. Okay. Yeah, so that's very clear. They have the commitment, we have the tracking mechanism for them, and we're going to base on that too, like evaluate their efforts. Yeah. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, I think we, you deserve a, a long applause for what you have done and for what you have done and what have you make an impact on animal welfare across the uh, planet. Thank you a lot. So that's also the end of the presentation section today. And I think um, I learn a lot. I am um, already gone through your slide and I already like feel excited. And now listening to your sharing, I it's a lot of ideas for me. It's a lot of information, and 
um, and, um, and ideas for me to process. And, and I hope the audience also do the same things. Um, thank you a lot and hope the best going to come to the animal welfare for all of us and our success is going to keep continue in the long future. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week. Yeah, Thanks. happy final day. <laughs> yeah.